Hey, good morning, First Church. We've never been up here. This is the toddler area of the church. And from up here, I can tell you, happy Mother's Day. As you can see, I've got my flowery tie on in honor of not just the moms, but women who play a role in the mothering of other people. Thank you guys for all that you do. Now, speaking of moms, I've heard that some moms dream of a silent house. Now, I'm not saying that moms don't love the sound of their kids playing, laughter wafting in from the other room and the questions of, why is the sky blue, mommy? You know, this shows the child is learning. Moms do love these sounds. But after a day full of tantrums, battles of the will during nap times, arguments with siblings and not giggles of glee, but screams of pain, there are times when all a mom wants to to, to do, all a mom wants to have is a moment of peace, a moment of quiet, a moment of silence. Well, moms, I'm sure you all know this game, but it was a, a life changer for me. And especially in my job when I used to work at a before and after school drop-in center with five and six-year-olds. You want a moment of silence? Play the quiet game. Play the quiet game. And if you don't know what it is, it's quite simple. The goal is to be the quietest, the longest. The first person to speak loses. You can do this in car rides, before meals, at bedtime. Use incentives so the kids want to play, but play the quiet game. And better yet, if you add the caveat that only mommy can talk, even though you may not want to, if only mommy can talk, guess what happens? You've got the kids' full attention, and they can finally hear you. They will finally listen. Silence allows for listening. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what we're about to hear. I pray that our hearts would be quiet enough to listen to what you want to say. Amen. Can you hear me now? Learning to Listen to God. That's the title of the sermon series that we're in right now. And this is week three of the series. In week one, we gave a brief overview of when and to whom God spoke throughout the pages of Scripture. And then I pointed out our desires to still have God speak to us today like he did in these pages. In week two, which was last week, we started looking at some very practical yet often challenging ways that we can learn to listen to God better. Stillness was the focus of last week, with a key verse being Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. The main story we looked at was the story of Elijah. This was a man of God, an extremely busy man doing God's work, but he heard God the best and the clearest when he actually intentionally took times of stillness. Elijah heard God's whisper on Mount Sinai, and you can only hear a whisper when you are still, pulled in close to the person who was doing the whispering. Today, we look at the next practical practice in our efforts to listen to God better, silence. Silence. Now, one could argue that stillness and silence could be used synonymously, and they may be at times. But as I attempted this practice of stillness this past week, like hopefully you all did too, I realized almost daily that my body could be still, but I was being anything but silent. So I'm purposely choosing to separate the two and keep silence as its own practice. Now, I'm sure at some point in your life, your mom told you, Child, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Shut your one mouth and open your two ears so that you can hear what I'm saying. The silence leads to hearing. King Solomon knew this, and he wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, There is a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Jesus' half-brother James encourages us in James chapter 1, verse 19, Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Mother Teresa once said, the fruit of prayer is a deepening of faith. The fruit of faith is love, and the fruit of love is service. But to be able to pray, we need silence, she said. Silence of the heart. And if we don't have that silence, we don't know how to pray. In the book written by Cornelius May, we read, silence allows our focus to shift squarely upon God, all that God is and all that God will do. We can hear God in the silence. In silence, we distinguish the Spirit's penetrating voice. 
George Mueller, whose persistence in prayer is unmatched in the Chronicles of Intercession, asking God on behalf of others, he had a distinctive twist on neology. He said, the most important time of prayer is the first 15 minutes after you say amen. Have we left our prayer closets too early? When God asks you, can you hear me now, does he need to have you play the quiet game first so that you can answer yes? Our problem today is that we live in a world of constant sound, unless maybe you live out in the country like the Williams family. There are always cars driving by, sirens blaring, clocks ticking, cell phones ring, the TV is turned on, your neighbor on one side of you listens to country music at volume 10 while working on their pickup, and the neighbor on the other side of you has a kid learning to play the trumpet at all hours of the day and night. We live in a world full of sound. So I bet you're thinking, Pastor, there's noise all around us. How can we ever find silence in order to listen better to God? And that's a fair question. You know, if, if only everyone would listen to the prophets of old, like Zephaniah and Zechariah or Habakkuk, all three of them said something very similar. Habakkuk 2, verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. If all the earth did that, at least we may get a little external silence. And maybe if we're going to put into practice the idea of silence, we need to start by looking at ways we can turn down the external noise. Again, to quote Mother Teresa, we need to find God and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass, they grow in silence. See the stars, the moon, and the sun, and how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. There are things you and I can do to quiet the external noises, believe it or not. Turn off the TV. Leave the AirPods out of your ears. Keep the radio off while you drive. This won't drown out all the noise, but it'll help. Now, you could also do what we've been encouraged to do since the COVID quarantine started. Get outside in nature, not just to exercise. Not just to enjoy the beauties of the world God made, but get outside in nature in order to be silent and listen, in order to pray without words. Jesus did this. In Luke 5, verse 16, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. In the book titled, Shh, Learning to Listen to God, the author writes this, Retreat fuels advance. Jesus said the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. So where did Jesus go to see? Solitude. And where did Jesus go to hear? Silence. Where did he go to hear? Silence. He got away from it all. All the hectic, all the chaos, all the noise. Couldn't we do that? Shouldn't we do that? I mean, maybe especially if you've got littles at home, or if you're stuck in your house like much of the rest of the country and you can't get out into the wilderness, maybe you need to find other ways to get outside. You know, honestly, this could be as simple as standing on your front porch or drinking your morning tea on your back balcony. It could be opening a window, feeling the crisp morning air and imagining that you're up on a mountain. Bottom line, be creative in and purposeful in turning down your external noise. The silence around you will help you listen to God better. But, but even if you get away, even if you get out into the wilderness like Jesus did, you may still face the noise coming from within. Even if you shut your mouth and didn't talk, the voices in your head and your heart may be even louder than before. I take each of my sons on a man venture every summer. We usually either kayak in or hike somewhere and go and camp for a couple of nights. Now, the quiet outdoors is awesome. But I usually sleep terribly on that first night out in the woods. I mean, at home, I sleep with a white noise machine, the sound of a babbling brook. Kind of ironic, I know. And I also sleep with a fan on. Out in the woods, I don't have those. So I hear the sounds of silence, which really isn't silent. I actually hear every branch creaking, every fish jump, and every animal that is moving around outside my tent or my hammock. Almost always, those animals are birds or chipmunks. But the internal voices that are screaming in my head and telling me the sounds, those sounds are bears. And they are just outside my tent, standing two legs, paws with claws raised, ready to attack and eat me. 
I'm not worried about me being eaten by the bears as much as I am my sons. Because I couldn't face Abby if I came home without the son I left home with. So even the silence of the wilderness, the voices in my head, they don't quiet down while I'm out there. This happens just about every time I try and practice silence in my devotional life too. My internal voices, they don't stop, which ultimately hinders my ability to hear God's voice. And no matter how much effort I put into it, the inner voices, the inner choir, I've never been able to be very successful quieting them. So over the years, I've realized I need God to do the work of quieting my head, my heart, my soul. A couple of weeks back, Pastor Jason mentioned a verse in Psalm 62. Now, there's two verses in this psalm that could speak directly to the internal noise I'm talking about. Psalm 62, verse 1 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. And verse 5, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is in him. The New Living Translation reads this latter verse like so. Let all that I am wait quietly before God. I mean, how's that for playing the quiet game, right? I read these verses in light of what we're talking about today, and I am reminded that my hope and the saving me from my inner critic, the inner voices, is only in God. He has to do the quieting. He has to do the silencing. Now, as I was studying for this week, this emphasis on silence in order to hear better from God, I thought I could simply tell you, friends, quiet the external noises, quiet the internal voices, and you will hear God better. In reality, though, things aren't that black and white. They're not that cut and dry. These two sets of sounds can overlap. They can churn. They can bleed into each other. They can wreak havoc on a person, even if that person is walking very closely to Jesus. See, silence is so hard to come by, to attain. I was reminded of this through a story that many of us are familiar with, yet a story we usually look at from a different angle, the angle of lacking faith. As I studied it more this past week, I saw this story through the lens of what we'd hear from God if we did have moments of genuine silence with him. I mean, ultimately, I think what we'd hear isn't so much or so often direct instruction for the things of daily life, but instead we'd hear who God is, who Jesus is, and what he can do. The story is found in the Gospel of Mark. Listen to it. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 and following. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Why do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Friends, I want to tell you this. It was in the silence that the disciples definitely heard. It was in the, the silence that the disciples finally heard. Let's put this passage into context. We're still early in Mark's telling of Jesus's life story. So far, if you start at the beginning, we've seen John the Baptist prepare the way for Jesus. We've seen Jesus's baptism in the wilderness and uh, his temptation in the wilderness. And we see him going out to the wilderness to pray. We see Jesus calling his first disciples, the first batch, and then the batch of 12 a couple of chapters later. We see some demon exorcisms and a fair amount of healings. Jesus then goes on to start teaching in parables. And by now, anywhere he goes, he's attracting quite the crowd. So things are starting to get pretty noisy around him. My guess is that is a big reason Jesus wanted to go away to the other side of the lake. He wanted to quiet the the rumble that had become a constant sound around him. If you've never been out on a boat in the middle of the night on a calm lake, you're missing out on one of the holiest moments in life. So peaceful, so quiet, so silent. See, I think this was what Jesus was hoping to share with his disciples. Silence on the water. So necessary when the people kept crowding around. Around Jesus, voices here, voices there. Jesus himself didn't struggle with quieting the noise. As you can see in the story, he is about to turn the noise off pretty quickly. He is cashed out. 
sound asleep, head on a cushion. But then chaos breaks loose around him. Nature raises her voice to a screaming pitch. The wind and the waves were arguing like siblings over whose toy it really is. And all hell was breaking loose on the waters, all while Jesus slept. So nature was not being silent. Nature was not playing the quiet game with the boat and the 12 boys in the boat. Nor was there internal silence within the voices of the disciples. I mean, think about it. Several of the men were experienced fishermen. They'd grown up on the water. They'd experienced these storms before. Internally, the voices probably started out with, huh, okay, here's a small northeaster. It'll blow over pretty quick. Yet that calm turned to panic soon thereafter. It turned to terror. I mean, imagine what they must have been thinking internally before waking Jesus up. I actually wonder if the phrase cursing like a sailor stemmed from the disciples' internal voices during the storm. <laughs> I wonder if they softened what they said to Jesus, made it a little bit more PG rated, right? Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care? Now, here's the reason this story makes it into a sermon on silence. Verse 39, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Silence, be still. Hear it again. Silence, be still. The Greek, the original language this text was written in really brings this statement to life. The first word in Jesus' command is siopa, which literally means to be silent. So Bible translators, like mine, got that right. Although many translations say peace, be still, which I'm not convinced is staying true to the meaning of the text. Anyways, here's where it gets good. The second Greek word, what most translations translate as be still, is the Greek word pephimoso, which has a literal translation meaning to muzzle or to put to silence. To muzzle. Picture what you do to a dog to keep it from barking. Or, or better yet, imagine in all those crime thriller movies where someone sneaks up behind somebody else, puts their hand over their mouth, and the person behind says, if you want to live, you've got to be quiet. Listen very closely to what I'm saying. Stay silent. And that's the picture the Greek word pephimoso is painting. This goes well beyond, kids, let's play the quiet game. And it moves into Jesus saying, if you want to live spiritually, you've got to be silent. You've got to be quiet. You've got to listen to my voice. Now in the story, obviously nature listened. The wind stopped. The text says there was a great calm. I mean, I love the, the painting you're seeing on the screen right now as it portrays the moments after nature listened to Jesus's command. This was nature's silence. But I'd argue that not only did nature listen to Jesus' voice, I'd argue that the disciples heard Jesus in a new and awe-inspiring way as well. I mean, they heard a new side of Jesus' voice that maybe they hadn't fully understood before and all the noise of ministry that Jesus had first called them into. I mean, in hearing Jesus, they understood a little more of who Jesus was and what Jesus could do. Mark 4, verse 31, says the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, perhaps in the back of their minds somewhere, they remembered their Sunday school lessons about God, Yahweh, and what God could do. The psalmist is speaking of God when he writes Psalm 65, verse 7. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves, and you silenced the shouting of the nations. Sometimes it takes Jesus muzzling us so that we can be silent long enough for us to truly hear him. And when we truly do hear him, I believe that same sense of awe that fell over the disciples on the quiet lake will fall over us. Is there a storm raging around you? Has the original calm of quarantine slowly raised its voice to where you cannot hear the voice of God due to all the other noises and voices around you? Your friends, small business owners, social media, the government, the protesters, your own kids wanting to go and play with their friends whom they haven't seen in close to two months. Are you deeply desiring? Are you recognizing the necessity you have to hear the voice of God in this time? 
If so, you need to find time for silence. You need to find time for silence. How? (laughs) I wish I had a simple answer for everyone, but alas, I don't. You know the ins and outs of your life way better than I do. You know where the noise is around you, and after listening to the sermon today, and more importantly, listening to the Holy Spirit, you may even already have some ideas as to ways you can practice silence. I want to do what I've done the last two weeks and give you a challenge. Last week, I encouraged you to take five minutes of stillness every day. I I hope you tried that. This week, I'd like to challenge you to find at least five minutes of silence each day. And on one day this week, I want to push you to practice silence for 30 minutes. Call it a sound Sabbath or a sound sabbatical. Turn off all the noise around you. Allow your mouth to be muzzled. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you silence the internal voices that are bound to rise up. And when they do, give yourself grace. I mean, remember, we are practicing silence. So we won't get it right the first time. And we won't get it right every time. I mean, it's possible that we don't even experience silence at all this week. But I want you to try. This is part of us working towards a resounding yes. When God asks us, can you hear him now? Moms or dads with kids, if you need some help with the kiddos leaving you alone so you can practice this five minutes a day of silence and the one time 30 minute silence, tell the kiddos you're playing the quiet game with God. Not for him to get a break from you, but for you to listen better to him. If you tell them, your kids, that you're playing the quiet game with God, your kids will understand. Take the time to be silent with Jesus this week and let him muzzle the noise in and around you. As you do that, share your experience on our Facebook page. Let's engage with each other. Let's learn from each other. Let's pray. Lord God, this week especially, we ask that you would silence the noise on our insides and help us be intentional with silencing the noise outside. We look forward to how you're going to do that. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.